Hi, this is Mike Young, and today we've got a program on bias. Uh, but first, to warm up our brains, let's try a couple exercises. So take a look at the uh, PowerPoint slide, and look at the squares. You see square A and you see square B. Tell me which one is darker. Now I know you're going to say this is an optical illusion, um, but in reality, it is an optical illusion, but both squares are the same colors. So let me show you. We'll, we'll isolate that. We'll pull square A over to square B and you see, aha, same color. All right, don't believe me. Let's try it, we'll look at it a different way. We'll block off the edges. You see A, you see B, they're the same color. And yet, when I take those edges away, you still see them as different colors. So your brain's doing something in there. Uh, let's try something else. Eventually this will all make sense. I'm gonna show you some pictures. So you see these five pictures. Now I'm going to give you a word fragment and just tell me the first word that comes into your mind. You ready? You said terrier, didn't you? All right, that was good. Let's try another one. Here's some more pictures. Now tell me what's the first word that comes into your mind? I know, you don't want to say it. I know it makes you feel a little uncomfortable to say it, but we all know what you were thinking. There's some association going on in your brain between some of these photographs and some of the words that you want to say. So we're going to explore this, um, this phenomenon. Because I noticed probably none of you came up with the word, say, terrific for this photograph. So let's see what's going on. What's happening in our brains? This is what um, we're going to be following, which is implicit bias. Uh, and the, the focus of this program is really coming from the seminal work of Daniel Kahneman and uh, some of his collaborators like Amos Tversky. Uh, Daniel Kahneman is a, he's kind of a, a hero in this field. He's got the book that many of you probably heard of and maybe even, even read called Thinking Fast and Slow. So Kahneman was a, 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 a psychologist out of Israel who won the Nobel Prize in economics. Now, why? Well, first, they don't have a Nobel Prize in psychology, but secondly, because his work really um, stepped over the line and started to introduce us to the concept of behavioral economics, um, decision-making, how we make decisions in ways uh, that impact, um, well, in ways that we don't really understand yet. So he was really kind of delving into our psyche and understanding how it is we make some of these, these decisions, and they really form the basis of our, our program today on implicit bias. Uh, if you're interested in Daniel Kahneman and uh, Amos Tversky, you might take a look at the Michael Lewis book called The Undoing Project. It's a, uh, Michael Lewis you probably know from Moneyball, uh, The Blind Side, um, The Big Short. So he did a little book on Kahneman and Tversky. It's more of a bromance than it is getting into the psychology of things, but it's pretty interesting if you like this stuff. Um, we are only going to touch the very surface of cognitive biases or implicit biases. If you pull up the Wikipedia page, you will notice that there are hundreds of different types of implicit biases that uh, sociologists and psychologists have found these days. We will just pick you know, two or three of them that impact our world and our lives as lawyers, uh, in my case as a mediator, and we'll see kind of how those impact what we do. So. It starts off with the way we think. Um, Kahneman looks at uh, two ways we think, what he calls them system one and system two. So system one is that fast thinking. So if you're uh, sitting somewhere, you hear a loud noise next to you, you jump, you turn, you look at it. You know, what's going on over there? Um, you don't stop and think, oh, wait a minute, there was a loud noise over there. It could be dangerous. Let me look over there and see what it is. Your body's already made that decision. You jump and you twit. That's your system one thinking. Um, Kahneman didn't invent the term system one, system two, they came from other psychologists, but he's kind of popularized them. And I think it's a good way for us to uh, think about the way we think that makes it kind of easier to understand if you think of them in terms of systems. So system one is this fast thinking. It is uh, involuntary, automatic, it's effortless, uh, it's very, very fast, and it's operating at the subconscious level. You don't even know what's happening. And so you contrast that. Well, let me, let me think about it this way. If someone says, you know, what's two times two? It's four. You don't even have to think about it. That is in your, your memory already. 
Uh, that's instant, that's fast, that's your system one answering that question. Two times two, you could be driving a car, you could be doing a lot of different things, you'll know that answer. Um, system two, by contrast, is slow. System two is, um, it's very deliberate, it's rational, it's thoughtful, it's effortful. Uh, and, and in that sense, it becomes lazy. Uh, you will take a lot of uh, intellectual resources to get your system two brain working. So if it can get by without working and let your system one make the decisions, it'll do that. Um, if you think about instead of two times two equals four, 24 times 38. You could probably figure that out in your head, but it's gonna take some effort. You're gonna have to sit there and you know, 24, 38, eight times four, two, carry a three. Eventually you'll get there uh, that's your system to work and pretty hard to get that to work. So let's take a look at uh, these things in operation. And if you were here, I would give you a prize to the first person who can answer this question. See how fast you can get it. A bat and a ball cost a dollar ten. The bat costs a dollar more than the ball. How much did the ball cost? All right. So you said ten cents. And that's your system one jumping in there. Now stop and think about it for a minute and do the math. In fact, if you look at the slide, I'll help you do the math. If the ball costs 10 cents and you add a dollar to it, that means the bat has to cost a dollar 10. Add a dollar 10 and 10, and what do you get? Dollar 20. Wait a minute. The bat and the ball cost a dollar 10. The bat cost a dollar more than the ball. That means if you do it slowly, the ball costs five cents. Everybody gets this one wrong. You can take this to MIT, you can take it to Harvard, you can take it to Stanford, you can take it to USC. Everybody will get it wrong because your system one is making a snap judgment uh, and in this case, that snap judgment is wrong. So what do we do with that? Um, when your system two gets kicked into gear and it's asked to focus and to um, do some of its deliberate thinking, it not only sucks up energy, it makes you blind to other things that are going on. Uh, there is a famous study which you can find on YouTube if you just type in uh, gorilla bias study. Uh, anything with a gorilla and a study, it'll, this one will come up. Uh, they've asked people to uh, they've shown two teams, a team in white shirts, a team in black shirts. They're walking around uh, on a stage and they're throwing balls to each other. And they ask you to watch the white team and count how many times they pass the ball between themselves. And so they're walking around in circles and the ball and bouncing a ball and you're counting at one, two, three, four. And at the end they say, all right, how many was it? And it's 16. And then they ask you, did you see the gorilla? In the middle of this exercise, with the balls passing back and forth, a gorilla walks onto stage and does this right in the middle of the camera and walks off the stage. And over 50% of the people don't see the gorilla. And I gotta tell you, I didn't see the gorilla. I was so focused on counting the ball back and forth, you missed the gorilla. So your system too, when it's engaged, can be blind to everything else that's going on. Um, and do the gorilla thing on, on, you'll find it on YouTube, it's pretty interesting. So it becomes blind because it's working so hard. So let's understand now the relationship between system one and system two and our thinking. And we'll spend a lot of time on system one because that's the one that gets us into trouble. That's where when we're talking implicit biases and ways that it impacts our decision making in ways that we probably wouldn't prefer, uh, it's because system one is doing this work. So, as Daniel Kahneman knows, System 1 is an associative machine, which means we link things together, we associate things together, um, we link concepts together. So think about a conversation that you would normally have. Uh, let's say you're talking to, to a friend and say, oh yeah, I just went to, uh, I went to the beach last, last week. Like, oh, the beach, I love the beach. I was over in Hawaii, they had a great beach down there. Oh, Hawaii, God, last time I was in Hawaii was in, you know, 1994. Oh, 1994, guys, I was only, you know, 24 years old at that time. Um, 24, I did some crazy things when I was 24. So you get the idea. The way we think, we associate, we link things together. Uh, that's how we think. 
Um, system one is really good at doing that. Um, so let's take a look at this slide. For instance, if someone offered you a glass of orange juice, looks delicious, I'll take it. Well, just think about it for a minute. What if somebody took a label from the cyanide bottle and stuck it on your glass of orange juice? Now you got a glass of orange juice and it says cyanide poison all over it. Would you drink it? Probably, because you know it's orange juice. You saw him pour the orange juice in there, but it's got cyanide written on the south side of the glass. It's going to make you feel a little bit uncomfortable because your system one is looking at the cyanide and it's got certain associations built in to what that means. Let's um, um, think about system one this way. It has a, an image of the world. This image of the world, of, of how the world works, it's been developed through your own lifetime and it's come along through the millennia too, through generations. Uh, when it sees something that happens around there, it compares it to its own image of the world. And if those two things match up, no problem. We don't have to call system two to come in to help. You know, we, can, we can make a decision because everything looks like it's lining up with what our expectations are. So we can see uh, an example of this. I mean, the, way, the way Kahneman talks about it, it says the main function of your system one is to maintain and update a model of your personal world. So which rec that represents what's normal in it. Um, the model is constructed by associations that link ideas of circumstances, events, actions, and outcomes that co-occur with some regularity, right? So either at the same time or within a relatively short interval. So in other words, it's seeing connections through your lifetime and it's making those connections as part of your mental model of what's proper in this world. Um, it, the impact of this is that it kind of makes you irrational in a sense, but in a very predictable way, like the bat and the ball problem. You know, we, we can predict you'll do that wrong. Um, and it becomes the title of Daniel Ariely's book, Predictably Irrational, so if you like this stuff, the book's hilarious, take a look at it. Uh, it'll take you into uh, some of the experiments that they've done to, to play with some of these concepts. But these are now cognitive biases. So these are biases that are in your head that are coming in at the subconscious level. And we're gonna see a little bit of how they operate and impact our decision-making as lawyers and as mediators. So the first one we're gonna explore is, is called subjective coherence. It's, cause and effect. It's the fact that our system one it likes stories, simple stories, and it will put pieces of uh, events together and link them to create a coherent story. And if it makes sense, we buy into it. So what do I mean by that? Um, take a quick example. Here's a story that uh, uh, Daniel Kahneman talks about. After spending a day exploring beautiful sights in the crowded streets of New York, Jane discovered that her wallet was missing. Okay. So they gave that little story to a number of people, and then a little, bit while, a little while later, they came back and they asked them, so tell me, which word was more strongly associated with the story, pickpockets or sites? As you can imagine, pickpockets was more closely associated with that story, even though the story said nothing whatsoever about pickpockets. The story was about crowded streets in, Los in uh, New York. And it was talking about the sites in New York. What happened is system one, it's got an image of New York. It has an image of crowded cities, crowded streets, and New York. And the concept of pickpockets is just naturally associated with that. So uh, when people were asked about it, pickpockets came to mind before sites did. Think about it this way. Um, here's a story, you're walking your dog through the forest and the dog eats a mushroom and a little while later gets violently ill. Cause and effect, right? He ate the mushroom, therefore he got sick. It makes sense. Why? Because we know some mushrooms are poisonous and so he ate the mushroom, he got sick, it must be the mushroom that caused it. Um, you could learn a new fact, like maybe the dog had just eaten bad meat before the mushroom, and then that might change your view of things. But the point is, we don't need, we don't even think about alternative um, causes or effects. We look at the simple thing, the dog ate the mushroom, 
it fits our model of the world. He got sick, therefore the mushroom caused it. So let's look at this in the context of litigation. Um, Kahneman calls this, this causal connection, the um, uh, subjective coherence. Uh, he says, finding causal connections is part of understanding a story. It's an automatic operation of system one. Because system two doesn't get called in, our, our conscious level doesn't get called in to work with this story because system one is not asking for help. It gets it. Mushrooms cause, cause illness. I don't need system two to come in here and think about this. So system two just kind of accepts it and moves on. So in... Um, Eventually, I'll get to this part about litigation. So um, Kahneman calls this what you see is all there is, or he, he abbreviates it's Wisati, Wisati, W-Y-S-I-A-T-I. -I. It's just what you see is all there is. In other words, system one sees the facts, builds your story, and doesn't think about anything else. It doesn't think about there maybe there's other explanations, there's other facts out there that might impact this. Um, it's making judgments based on the information it has, and doesn't stop to think about maybe there's information out there it doesn't have that could impact things. Uh, in fact, it's very confident with the less information there is, it's very confident that uh, its correlation, its story that it's created is the right one. So, um, for all you plaintiff's lawyers out there, do you take this case? An attractive young woman complains to HR that she's being sexually harassed at work. Sh uh, shortly thereafter, she's fired. Should take the case? So I've asked this before in groups of employment lawyers, every single plaintiff lawyer raised their hand and said, I'm taking that case. Because why not? You've got protected activity. First, you've got bad conduct, unlawful conduct in the sexual harassment. You've got protected activity in the complaint to HR. And you've got an adverse job consequence, which is the firing. Perfect case, that one's teed up beautifully for big damages, maybe punitive damages. So system one says, Cause and effect, nothing out of the ordinary. System two doesn't even get kicked into gear, it's so easy. So let's, um, let's change the facts a little bit. Let's add a, add a new fact. The employee had just been written up um, for failing to wear safety equipment on the workforce, in the work area. Now do you take the case? Most people say, yeah, why not? So she got written up. Of course she got written up. That's pretext. The company had to write her up because they can't just fire her for complaining about sexual harassment. Everyone knows that's wrong, so they have to have a reason. So let's pick on, oh, she didn't wear safety goggles. Let's write her up, fire her for that. Right? So most people will take the new information that you get. It fits your story. It fits the same, it's got, uh, this, uh, fits the same facts as the story. So... System two doesn't get called in. System one has got this thing worked out beautifully. All right, so let's think about something else. Let's add, uh, let's add what Daniel Kahneman says about this. So he calls this subjective coherence. What, he's, what he talks about in this sense is that system one not only uh, brings the new information and fits it to the story, so you have this coherence, it also suppresses ambiguity. So if there's any kind of questionable way to interpret the facts, it will interpret it in a way that's consistent with the story and suppress the ambiguous interpretation. Um, therefore, you're not needing to call in System 2 to think very hard about it. System 1's really good at this, and we're gonna see a little bit later how this gets into trouble. Um, so we add a third fact now. Now this um, plaintiff, you learn that the defense has a video of the woman going to the till, opening it up, and looking around furtively, taking the money out of the cash box and sticking it in her pocket. All right, now she just ripped off the entire store, lots of money, and it's on videotape. Now do you think differently about this case? Uh, probably the answer is yes. Now you start to think differently about it because this new fact doesn't fit. You can't interpret it in a way to fit the story that you had been building all along. So system one sitting there saying, all right, we've got a complaint, we've got a firing, we've got some pretextual write-up, this is great. Now we have, wait a minute, evidence of stealing. System two kicks in and says, we gotta rethink. So 
Cognitive ease is the concept Kahneman likes to talk about. The fact that your system one easily makes these decisions, these linkages, these conclusions. Uh, and it's not until something really uh, abnormal kicks in before your system two decides to get involved. Um, so as he says on the slide, the combination of a coherent seeking system one with a lazy system two implies that system two will endorse many intuitive beliefs which closely reflect the impressions generated by system one. In other words, system two being lazy, if the beliefs of system one kind of make sense, right up until that last fact, system two will just endorse it. Yeah, sure, that's fine. Um, and even when system two gets involved, now you've got the woman stealing from the till and system two, two's going, wait, what? Let's take a look at this. It's still going to be influenced by the initial conclusions that system one made that there's definitely an unlawful termination going on here. So um, one of the interesting things about this, and it's gonna impact you as lawyers too, the, the fewer facts there are, the more confident you are gonna be with your system one decision. So in other words, if all you know about is there was a complaint of sexual harassment and a termination, and then there's a fire, I mean, a firing after the complaint, you're confident, you're not only confident, you are absolutely positive that there's a cause and effect and that this is gonna be a big dollar case. And in fact, the more facts you learn about the case, the less confident you become. And one would think the more information you have to draw your conclusions, the more confident you'll be of your conclusion. It's not the case. It's usually the fewer facts you have, the more confident you are. And the more facts you have, so the more you understand the ambiguities and the less confident you, you become. So let's take a look now at uh, another concept that ties into this. It's called confirmation bias. And you've probably heard of confirmation bi bias, but we're going to look at how it links in uh, to this cognitive ease and uh, the associative machine of subjective of system one. And we'll see how this ties together. So from here, I'm pulling a little bit from uh, Dan Gilbert, who's a Harvard professor, and if you want to take a look at his book, Stumbling on Happiness, you'll get a kick out of that one too. It doesn't exactly talk about what we're talking about here, but it's kind of a fun read. But nonetheless, we take uh, Dan Gilbert, who talks to us a little bit about confirmation bias, and he says, look, this is the tendency uh, that we have to search for, interpret, favor, and recall information that is in a, confirms our pre-existing beliefs and hypotheses. So in other words, if we come up with an initial conclusion, when we see new information that comes along, confirmation bias is the sense that we interpret that new information in a way that's consistent with the conclusion we already reached. So we saw a little bit of that, <coughs> excuse me, in the um, uh, <coughs> sexual harassment uh, hypothetical. So she's fired, and then we learn new facts, there's a write-up. We start to interpret that in a way that says it's consistent with a wrongful termination, right? That's the confirmation bias. We're seeing the new information and interpreting it in a way to confirm our beliefs. So um, system one, very good at that. System one's good at suppressing doubt. It's system two's job to um, understand doubt and to see doubt uh, and to understand ambiguities. So system two never gets called in. System one is just keeping its story straight. Um, think of it this way. So, um, you know, let's say you meet somebody at work for the first time and you're kind of a jerk, right? You, were not, you're not, you didn't bring your A game. So uh, this person kind of thinks, wow, you know, he's kind of a jerk. So you decide after that, to, look, I gotta make it up to this person. That's not really who I am. So the next day you bring this person a nice big cup of coffee. You say, hey, look, I'm, I'm sorry I got off the wrong foot. Here you go. What does the person think? Do they think, uh, oh yeah, that's really nice of them, thanks. Or do they think, can you believe that guy? First he's a jerk to me yesterday, now he's trying to manipulate me by bringing me coffee today? That's outrageous. The, that first initial impression, impression will have long-lasting implications and it will impact the way people see your actions later on. And so here you are trying to be nice, give them a cup of coffee, and what do you get in return? Uh, great, another guy's just trying to manipulate me. So think of it in your, in your practice. Um, let's say you send an email to opposing counsel asking for an extension on some discovery responses because you've got some family matters coming up and you don't get a response back. 
So you send off another email to them and uh, you ask them, you know, please give me an extension and still get no response. Now you're angry at them. How dare they ignore you like this? This is an important thing. And then you rattle off some, some nasty email. Um, your first initial impression is, this guy's blowing me off. And then everything that happens after that, you're saying is consistent with your initial impression. And you don't stop to think for a minute that maybe the guy's in trial. Maybe the guy's in the hospital and he can't respond to email. Maybe, you know, there's lots of possibilities to explain away the failure to respond to an email. But, you know, our, our system one is so used to thinking opposing counsel, nasty people, always trying to get an edge. Obviously, they're ignoring me. We're going to take right now a quick look at some other concepts, other biases. Take a look at this photo on the, on the screen. And you see the city line, um, the city's skyline with uh, buildings and banks and whatnot. And now take a look at this statement. Anne approached the bank. What do you think? What image pops into your head when you read Anne approached the bank? Probably a woman walking down up to the ATM with her purse and you know, we're going into the bank to talk to the teller. But now take a look at this photograph. Anne approached the bank. You can see the picture of the river and the, and the river banks on the side. And now what image comes to your head when you read that very same sentence, Anne approached the bank? And you probably see a woman walking by the water, maybe with a fishing pole or something, or ready to drop her feet from the river bank into the water and cool off a little bit. So the, the sentence didn't change. What happened was there's an ambiguous word in there, the word bank. And the question is, your brain's now got to interpret that in a way to, in order to make the story to make sense. So in the first instance, when the pictures of the, of the city was there, your system one said, I know how to interpret bank. That means like a bank, that, a building that you go into with you know, exchange money and whatnot. Right? The second time, when you're looking at the photograph of the river, your, your system one's going, I got to interpret the word bank. Well, how about a river bank? That's, that works. And so these images have primed your mind to interpret ambiguous words in a certain way. Um, so this priming effect is, is really, it was uh, discovered by, or at least it was popularized by a um, psychologist named uh, John Barg, who just came out with a new book, by the way, if you want to go look for his book. And uh, he did some studies where people came in and made, uh, made sentences out of words. And some of the words involved like gray or Florida, um, things that were associated with old people. They didn't use the word old, but they just had different words associated with old. Uh, and, the, and so these, these uh, subjects that most of them are students, you know, used these words and made sentences out of them. And then he said, all right, thanks, you did a great job. Now let's head down to the hall into the other room. Uh, we've got some other questions for you. And then the real experiment began. Uh, what they wanted to do was to watch these people walk down the hallway after they had done these word puzzles to see if there was any change in, their, in the way they walked. And what they found was those people who had, had uh, old words in their puzzles, uh, like the gray and the Florida and the retirement, walked slower down the hallway, even had a little bit of a hunch over in their back, um, they were actually primed to feel old. And the people who didn't have those same words uh, were much springier in their steps and walked much more briskly down the hallway. So there have been a lot of studies on priming to see how it impacts, impacts our behavior. Um, and it can be primed and you know, now you start to understand like those first puzzles we did. You know, when I showed you the pictures of the dogs and had the word T-E-R, the phrase T-E-R, you came up with terrier. And when I showed you the images of the Muslim men, you came up with terrorists, right? You were primed to think that way because we have, over our lifetime, associated pictures of dogs with terriers. And at least in North America since 2011, we've been associating Muslim men with terrorists. It's implicit in our system and it's the way it happens. Those images prime us to think in a certain way. Um, you can prime with words, and Daniel Kahneman has a great story where he was out to dinner with his wife uh, with a third friend, and after dinner, they, Daniel and his uh, wife were talking, and she said, yeah, that man is sexy. And then Daniel says, I heard her say, 
he doesn't undress the maid himself. He's going, what? And so he asked her, what did you say? And she said, he doesn't underestimate himself. And Dan said, oh. He, even though he now understands what happened, when she said he looks sexy, he was primed to hear the next thing she said about undressing the maid. Uh, he was still confident that she said something about undressing the maid. Even though he knows that's not what she says, in his mind he still hears it and says, you know, that's what he heard. That priming impact was that strong. So we can prime with words, we can also prime with sounds. There was a study where a wine shop played French music for a week and guess what? They sold a lot of French wine. The next week they played German music, they sold a lot of German wine. So even though um, there's no signs, there's nothing different about the store or, or any sales, just the fact of playing that music had that, that subjective, unconscious impact on buyers. Uh, and, and you can impact and prime with images. And so if you take a look at the screen, uh, there was a, a study done in London where there was a, an honor bar and the uh, employees would come into the bar and they would get tea or coffee or something and they would put money in the, in the box. So sometimes they would have pictures of flowers up on the wall and sometimes they'd have pictures of eyeballs, just the, just the portions of the face, you know, of the eyes. And they studied how much money was left in the honor box during those weeks and sure enough, if you look at the chart, every time the flowers were there, they had a lower amount. But when they had pictures of eyes up there, there was a much higher amount of money placed in the honor box. And what System 1 is doing, even subconsciously and kind of stupidly, when it sees eyeballs, it has an association of eyeballs being watched. And when people are being watched, they're much more honest. And in fact, they were much more honest there. System 2 never got kicked in. No one ever came to System 2 and said, hey, look, is this making sense? They're just pictures on the wall. Um, the behavior was, was uh, changed nonetheless. So let's take a look at this one because I think this one's interesting and particularly for, for us as lawyers. Uh, if we tie priming with confirmation bias, you know, so you get impacted by uh, a word, a sound, an image, and then um, information follows from that that we then through confirmation bias interpret to be consistent with our first impressions, you can see that it, it makes a big difference. So I'm going to give you some adjectives to describe two people, Alan and Ben. So for Alan, he's intelligent, industrious, impulsive, critical, stubborn, and envious. For Ben, he's envious, stubborn, critical, impulsive, industrious, and intelligent. Who do you judge more favorably of the two? Lo and behold, most people find Alan to be more favorable. But of course, if you look at the adjectives used to describe the two of them, they're exactly the same. They're just in a different order. But if you look at Alan, it starts off with intelligent. So now your first impression of Alan, he's a bright guy. And with confirmation bias, the things that follow now are going to be interpreted in a way that's going to be consistent with your first impression. So he's industrious, he's impulsive. You get to critical, that's kind of an ambiguous word. You probably in this sense think, well, he's critical in the sense like, an art critic, you know, he's objective, he's giving you a critical analysis of, of something. Ben, on the other hand, is envious and he's stubborn. So already I don't like Ben that much. Then I get to critical. Yeah, he's probably critical, he's probably telling you what to do all the time. Critical in the sense of being judgmental, uh, impulsive. So I don't really like Ben. This is the power of both priming and, co and confirmation bias is that those first impressions do in fact matter because they impact all the impressions and interpretations that come later particularly of things that are ambiguous like you know, the word critical. So how can this help in our lawyering? There, there's been some studies and this was when uh, Hillary Clinton was before her her run for president because things may be different now but at least back then um, women were asked to give a speech and in the back of the hall there were pictures of Angela Merkel and Hillary Clinton for some people. For others the wall was blank and for still others I think they had Bill Clinton or, or some other people. 
And what they found were the women who had those images of powerful and successful women public speakers on the back wall had longer speeches uh, and they were independently judged to be much more effective. Uh, and it was the priming effect of seeing these role models that gave the speakers much more confidence and they in fact performed better. So what we can do, what all of us can do, is you can prime yourself, prime yourself with conduct. You can strike a power pose before you go into a speech. And in fact, there were studies done where they had people strike a power pose like Superman, you know, shoulders up and back, chest out, um, and then went into a job interview. And those who had struck a power pose were much more likely to get the job than those who had done something um, kind of more closed in before they went into their job interviews. So if you think about it, if this is your power pose, and you've got your fans on your hips and your shoulders out, your anti-power pose, something that sucks the energy out of you and makes you feel less confident, is going to be something closed in like this. And if you notice, this is pretty much how all of us are all day as we walk around with our cell phones down, head down, shoulders. So if you're walking around doing this, you're actually priming yourself to be weaker and less confident. So at least before you go to court, or you go, before you go into mediation or arbitration, or before you go into a big meeting with a client, put your phone away. Stand up, strike a power pose, and prime yourself to be confident, and by golly, you will be. So let's take a look at one other cognitive bias called framing. We're going we're to skim through this in a second. There's a lot on... on out of the literature, you can find a lot, but I want to just touch on it a little bit. If uh, you had a project that you could invest in, would you invest in one that project A, it's 95% reliable, or project B, which fails 230 times out of 600 tri 6, trials? Project A, 95% reliable. Um, most people say pro project A is better. And why? Because your system one is looking at this thing and it's saying, Project A, 95% reliable. That's like a good solid A. That's practically an A plus. And it's reliable. I like reliable in my investments. Boom. But if you could kick your system two into gear and to actually do the math, you'll find out Project B is 96.2% reliable. Better. So project B is your better option, but because of the way it's framed, the way I described it to you and gave you the options, we threw out reliable. Uh, that kicks your system one into gear, and now you're making decisions based on that rather than on doing the math. So you'll see this a lot in, you know, say, food. Would you rather eat meat that's 80% fat-free, or would you like to eat some meat that's 20% fat? Um, I see that sometimes. Oh, here we go, some doctors. So a doctor comes to you, could ask you, tell you, look, you got a serious condition, you need some surgery. Uh, and I got to tell you, this surgery's got a 10% chance of killing you. Yeah, doc, I'm not so sure. That doesn't sound so great. 10% chance of dying? But if the doctor comes and says, uh, yeah, we've got this surgery, you should consider it. It's got a 90% success rate. Oh, hey, that's an A. 90%, that's pretty good. Right? So just the way they frame the options for you will impact the way you perceive the, the odds or the advantages of each one. System one's going, 10% chance of killing me? I don't want to be killed. But 90% success rate? I'll take that one. And system two, of course, is saying, they're both the same. There's no difference. Um, sometimes I get that with lawyers. Uh, when I get some overly optimistic lawyers in a mediation and they're sitting there, they'll say, we've got a 70% chance of winning this case through trial. And we're thinking, there's no way, this is much closer than that. But they say, 70% like, chance of winning. So sometimes I'll ask their client, so you good with that? I mean, you good with a 30% chance of losing at trial? And I was like, oh, 30% chance of losing, that doesn't sound so good. So even I can kind of mess with the framing a little bit uh, to get people to look at things from different perspectives and maybe uh, take that system one initial bias out of the picture. 
All right, let's do anchoring. Uh, this will skim through this relatively quickly too, but I think there's a big misunderstanding about anchoring. Um, Kahneman and Tversky did this study back in the 70s, and it's been famous, and it's kind of led to uh, maybe some misunderstandings about anchoring, but it's a real thing. What they did is they took a roulette wheel, and they spun it in front of their class, and the number came up 65. And then they asked the class, all right, is the percentage of African nations in the UN more or less than 65%? And they would have a discussion about it. And then he would say, all right, everybody write down what your guess is for the percentage of African nations in the UN. And the class came up with an average of 45%. Then they did the same thing in other classes, uh, but they spun their wheel and it was a rigged wheel, but the students didn't know it. And they spun it the second time and it came up 10. And they asked, they had a discussion with the class is the percentage of Ameri African nations in the UN more or less than 10%? Talked about it, and then finally said, all right, we'll write down your guess. And in that situation, the guesses came out to be 25%. So the only difference between these was that the roulette wheel said 65, and they talked about whether or not it was more or less than 65%, and they guessed 45. And the other one, which was 10, and they talked about is it more or less than 10%, and then the guess turned out to be much lower, 25%. Uh, the study's been repeated, I don't know, thousands of times, but um, one of them you can, you can see up on the slides deals with the height of redwood trees. And people were asked, is the tallest redwood tree more or less than 1,200 feet? People thought about it and they said, then they said, all right, guess, what's the highest redwood tree? The uh, average answer came out to 844 feet. And then they asked a whole bunch of people, is the height of the tallest redwood more or less than 180 feet? So rather than 1,200 feet, they said 180 feet. And then they said, guess. And the average, and that one was 282 feet. So that's about uh, it's almost 600 feet difference in the guesses, the only difference being the anchor, the 1,200 or the 180 feet that was used in forming the question. So what's going on with, because again, I'm, I'm trying to figure out what's, what's happening here with our system one and our system two, and why is it being impacted and affected so much by such an arbitrary number? Um, and I think the answer here is what system one does, it, it's not very good, as we've seen, on doing deep thinking. So it's not sitting there th saying, well, let's measure a tree. I think it looks about this big. How many people? Six feet. I could probably get 12 people up there. Yeah, it's not doing that kind of math to try to estimate height. What it does do instead, and it's really good at, is changing the question. So instead of answering the question, how high is the tree, it's saying, is the, redwood tr is, is the tallest redwood tree bigger or smaller than this 1,200 feet? or the 180 feet. It's good at comparing things. So it's not good at figuring it out to begin with, but it's pretty good at comparing, well, 1,200 feet sounds way too big, so it must be less than that. Um, we can see that sometimes in restaurants. So you'll have a restaurant where the uh, sautéed filet of Atlantic halibut, $45. And you're gonna be asked, is that a good deal? It's hard to tell. I don't, you know, how much does the fish cost? You know, how, how do they prepare it? Is this a high rent district? Is that a good price? I don't know. But if the restaurant puts right above it the sweet butter poached Maine lobster for $75, now that halibut starts to look pretty good. Because system one's having a hard time trying to figure out what the value is of a halibut. But if it's asked which looks better, $75 lobster, $45 halibut, that one system one can answer. It's pretty good at that. Um, and in fact, some restaurants have been known to put their most profitable item on the menu just underneath the really absurdly expensive item so that the most profitable one looks like a great bargain and people go buy that one. So if you see that like $152 steak, that's probably the bogey and the thing that's right under it is probably the most profitable item. Um, so the anchoring, we see that a lot in our negotiating. Uh, plaintiff's lawyers like to come out sometimes, uh, at least I've seen in a lot of fields, with some astronomically high numbers, thinking maybe they're anchoring the discussion around that. Uh, and I think that's a mistake. 
So when I see plaintiffs, uh, plaintiffs coming out with a, it's maybe a $50,000 case, uh, and their first number out of the box is 1.2 million. I think the idea is maybe they think they're trying to anchor the discussion high, but it doesn't have that impact when it's so out, outside the range. Uh, it's like saying, is, is the tallest redwood taller or smaller than three miles high? It doesn't really serve as, as an anchor because your, your system, one, knows it's outrageous to even think about a three mile high tree, so it doesn't even make that, uh, take that secondary step of is it bigger or smaller than that. Uh, there has to be some uh, value that's not known that um, the anchor then can kind of impact. So you don't know how high a redwood is, you don't know how many African nations are in the UN, so that anchor then can have some kind of an impact. But, uh, you know, sometimes for, for value, evaluation of cases, there is a value. We do sort of have a sense for what a case should settle because we've done so many of these things. So an outrageously high anchor doesn't serve as an anchor. All right, um, the halo effect we'll, we'll run through quickly. Uh, the halo effect is simply we tend to be influenced by experts. Um, you know, if you look at Steve Jobs and you look at Elon Musk here, they're heroes in some sense to some people. Um, and whatever they say, it's believed, you know? Uh, a Ford can drive down and catch on fire on the road and people are going, that's outrageous. Why is this car catching on fire? We ought to, there ought to be recalls and we ought to have the head of the CEO and they better explain things or be fired. A Tesla can drive down the road and its batteries catch on fire and everyone's going, ah, Elon will fix it. You know, it's just, it's, we're starting a new product and it'll, it'll be fine. And in fact, that's what happened. The Teslas were catching on fire. The batteries were catching on fire. And nobody said there, Elon's got to be fired. Let's get rid of him. They're talking about, he'll fix it. So he's got that halo effect. Um, even Apple still, with Steve Jobs passing, is going to sell you a $1,000 phone. People, yeah, $1,000, that's all for the Apple 10 or the X. That's going to be fantastic. Can't wait. So there is some impact to this halo effect, these experts. Um, and one of the things that you will probably notice, uh, and you probably know this subconsciously, and now you're gonna know it consciously, pretty people uh, benefit from this halo effect. Handsome people benefit from the halo effect. So um, business graduates, for instance, have earned about $600 a year more for every inch they have an extra height. So tall people make more money. The presidential elections were won 17 out of 21 times by the taller candidate. Um, and this one's a little bit scary, but the more attractive defendants in criminal defendants were less likely to be convicted. And if they were convicted, they served 22 months less prison time. And the correlation is handsomeness because people have there might be a genetic reason uh, or, or an evolutionary reason for us believing that handsomeness, attractiveness uh, is a benefit. And that goes back to in, in the old days, prehistoric days, even in plant life, when there's a genetic deformity, symmetry gets off. So if somebody is asymmetrical way back when, uh, it may be an indication that there's a disease, and so for hereditary purposes, if you could find a symmetrical person that indicated health. So maybe that's part of what's happening to us now, a million years later, um, but it's having an impact in our criminal justice system. It's, it impacts politics too. You know, who's gonna make the, who's gonna be a good president? You know, now system two can, pop in here and start saying, I know who makes a good president. First, they're gonna to have to research what their, the issues are and where they stand on the issues that are important to me. Um, you know, are they of good character, moral fiber and all that stuff. That's a lot of work, that's system two work. Or what system one does, it's so good at doing, is changes the question and it says, I don't know much about all those issues stuff, but I know who looks presidential. I'm pretty good at seeing presidential so I'm gonna decide based on who looks presidential. 
What happens with that is then we get Warren G. Harding as president, who most people consider the at least second worst president we've ever had, uh, but a very good looking guy. And his, his cabinet was rife with scandal and he didn't survive a, a single term. Um, and you've heard people say, Vice President Mike Pence, he looks so presidential. I mean, he does look vice presidential, presidential, nice silver hair and combed and you know, clean cut. And system one is saying, that's a good president. And it's system two that's got to kick in then. And, um, but that halo effect of, of attractiveness is now impacting politics. So let's think about the halo effect and uh, its implications for, say, a trial practice. Um, is the defendant guilty or not guilty? That's kind of like who makes the best president. You need system two to kick in and start analyzing, well, let's take a look at the evidence and, and apply it to the law that's here and uh, let's interpret some of the ambiguous stuff and we'll figure, out, figure it out. That's a system two project there. System one, it's too much work. So system one changes the question and it says, who do I think, do I think this person looks guilty? And uh, they start looking at things like the shoes or the hair or just the persona. Is this a guilty looking person? And this is where we're, when we talk about race and gender in a minute, race and gender kicks in. You know, are there uh, pre-existing prejudices against people of different races that may make them look more guilty? Um, in trials too, we use experts. So we've got the halo effect impacting experts. Your family doctor, he's an expert. I don't know medicine, so when the doctor tells me I need this or that, I, okay, I'll follow that. So I mean, in a sense, that's good. We want system one to be able to make those uh, quick decisions. If your family doctor says you need something, you want to go along with that. So it's a good, it's a good reaction to have. Uh, but it also means that in trial, when your experts speak, system ones are going, well, yeah, you know, the expert's saying it, so I kind of believe it. So there's an inherent uh, bias in favor of understanding and believing, I should say, uh, your experts. So you need to be careful in terms of what experts you are bringing and what they have to say. So you, you tie these, this halo effect into the confirmation bias and you see the long-term effects this could have. I believe this expert, therefore the things I start hearing afterwards I'm going to interpret in a way that's consistent with my initial belief, which is this expert's right. Or uh, I've got an implicit bias against African Americans. This is an African American defendant. He looks guilty to me. I'm going to now, through confirmation bias, interpret the, the evidence that comes in later to be consistent with my initial thoughts. Those are where the dangers start to kick in. All right. Um, <clears throat> let's take talk about race and gender for a second. And if you take a look at the screen, you will see what was a very common picture of a symphony orchestra. And if you'll notice, it's not that hard to notice, everybody there is a white male. Not exactly true. I studied this one and I found two women. One of them is the harp player, and all women played the harp, unless you were Harpo Marx, which is the only guy I knew who played the harp, but otherwise it was mostly women playing harps. And it looks like a Possibly a cellist back there as a woman. Everyone else is a white male. So the experts who were doing the auditions and deciding who gets to be part of the symphony were asked, are you guys prejudiced against non-white males? Why is everybody white males? And to a T, the answer was, no, we're not prejudiced, we're not biased, we're just listening to the candidates when they come in and play at the auditions and we pick the best musicians. Most people didn't buy it because how is it possible that all the best musicians were white males? So there was a suspicion that implicit bias was going on. That there were, even though these judges were in their own minds being as honest as they possibly could, something subconsciously was impacting the decision making so that they were uh, trending towards white males. So what, what happened? They put up screens. They put up blind screens and the, um, when people would come to audition, they would be behind the screen. The, the judges couldn't see whether the candidate was male or female, black, white, Asian, Hispanic, anything else. They just heard the music. And lo and behold, 
orchestras started to become more diverse. There still was a tr uh, trend towards males until somebody figured out when the players came across the stage to sit behind the screen to play, women tended to come in high heels and they could hear the click, 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 click of the high heels and so they only knew it was a woman candidate. So now that they took the shoes off, they couldn't tell whatsoever and your um, orchestra started to become much more diverse. Uh, so one way of uh, impacting that initial prejudice, your system one bias, was to blind system one with uh, blind auditions. Um, this raises up this whole notion of an implicit association that you have. Remember I said system one is associative, meaning it, it, it links together images, uh, concepts, things from your past. The two, two sociologists, Anthony Greenwald and Mazarin Banaji, came up with an implicit association test. And if you Google Harvard bias test, or you can do IAT or implicit association test, you will find this online and I urge you to do that and take this test. What it does is it measures your implicit bias uh, in certain categories, black over white, uh, men and women, um, <clears throat> Muslims and whites, weapons, non-weapons. Uh, what it's doing is it's measuring your uh, associations that you have with different characteristics. So for instance, it'll show you an image of a black male face or a white male face. And it'll ask you, for simple, hit the left side if the image pops up and it's black, hit the right button if the image pops up and it's white. And so images will pop up and you hit left or right depending and it, um, it measuring the time it takes you to hit the buttons. That part's easy. The next step is they show you words, good words. Uh, some of the good words we have, terrific, joyful, cheer. Some of the bad words they show, evil, greed, grief. And they'll ask you if it's a good word, hit this button. If it's a bad word, hit this button. And so they put those up there. Then the hard part comes up. They say, all right, if it's an African-American face or a bad word, click the left button. If it's a white face and, or a good word, hit the other right button. And so then it intersperses faces with words and you're going left, right, left, right. Um, and then it mixes it up again and it says, well, if it's African-American and good, hit this button. If it's white or bad, hit that button and you're hitting the buttons. What it's doing is it's measuring the time it takes you to figure out which button to push. And what it finds is if you show a white bias over black, it'll be much faster for you to hit a black word associated with a bad, or sorry, a black face with a bad word or a white face and a good word. Um, if, uh, if, so they measure those speeds and you will be shocked I think if you try it, because you will find out you are biased. You don't want to be biased. Subject, uh, consciously you're not biased, you are not prejudiced, but subconsciously it takes you more time. If you're showing a white over black bias, it will take you more time to associate a black face with a good word and a white face with a bad word. Um, and the same, same is true with Muslims and whites and some of the other things. So. <clears throat> Let's take a look at the impact of this type of implicit bias on, on gender and race in our legal profession. Um, for women in the profession, we can take a look at the population. 54% of the population is, are women. 47% are law students. 31% of lawyers are women. These statistics are a little bit old, but I think they're close enough that they're uh, relatively accurate. So of the 31% lawyers who are women, 46% are associates, and then we get to partners, 20% equity partners, 15%. 27% of judges. So let's take a historical view of this. In 1960, it doesn't seem like that long ago. It's when I was born. I know I may feel old, but it's not that long ago. 1960, only 3% of attorneys were women. Um, 1981, so I'm graduating from college, 
we finally get our first woman Supreme Court justice, uh, Sandra Day O'Connor. Uh, 1993 is when Janet Reno became the first U.S. Attorney General who was a woman. Um, and 73 percent of women have reported some sort of gender bias in their careers. Now let's take a look at just some of our, our key Supreme Court justices, women justices, the four we've had. Justice O'Connor, 1952, she was a top Stanford law grad. She was offered a secretarial job when she graduated from law school. Justice Ginsburg, 1959, she graduated from the top of her class in Columbia Law School, no job offers. And someone said, suggested to her that maybe she should apply for a secretarial job. Justice Sotomayor, 1978, she was interviewing with Shaw Pittman and they told her, you know, at Yale, you're probably there only because of affirmative action. And in 1991, she becomes the first Hispanic federal judge on the bench. Justice Kagan, 1986, Harvard Law, she's number one in her class. She law clerks for Justice Marshall and in 2003 becomes the first woman dean of Harvard Law and in 2009 the first female solicitor general. So um, in terms of racial minorities, we can start to see how bias has impacted our profession there. 30% of the population, 20% of the law students, 10% of the lawyers are minority, 20% associates and only 7% partners. So I'll put some other facts up on the screen you can take a look at in terms of the historical timeline of when African Americans started to make some inroads into the legal profession uh, and, and others. In, in 1967 is when Thurgood Marshall first became appointed to the Supreme Court. We didn't have our first Asian American federal judge until 1971 and first Native American federal judge in 1994. So what is it that we can do? What is it we can do as uh, lawyers, as people, to try to control our implicit biases, how to get a system one, which we rely on for just about everything we do to keep us alive, how can we control it to try to minimize the negative impacts of that bias? Um, there's really two things we can do. We can do one, get system two involved. So when we're in situations where system one may make errors, where may impact our decision making in ways that we don't want it to, uh, we got to get system two involved so we become more rational, more thoughtful. It's more, it takes more energy, but we've got to do that. Uh, and then secondly, we got to change the associations. Remember, so system one is an associative, so we got to change those linkages so that when we see, uh, you know, images of Muslim men, we don't think terrorist anymore, right? So we've got to work on those two angles. How do we do that? We can do that with um, um, think of the bad impression you make over with somebody. You got to change your that impression. You got to make a good impression. So remember that story about you bring a cup of coffee to someone and they think, oh great, now they're just trying to manipulate me. You're going to have to bring a cup of coffee a day for a month. You got to just keep doing it until you start to change that person's associations of you being a jerk to you being actually a really nice guy. Um, more importantly than that is you can work with people. So if you tend to have a, a bias uh, of, against African Americans, against women, against any kind of group, put them on a team with you and start working with them and you'll start seeing, all right, this is not a generic trait. This is, I've got an individual here who's doing great work and you start relying on that individual, that's going to start changing the associations you have. Um, <clears throat> get some neutral endpoints, yeah, inputs. So if you are in a situation where you're making decisions and, the, and you think that might be stuck with what you see is all there is and if, in, the, in the sense that your system one is making these cause and effect linkages bring somebody else in who doesn't have those same linkages. Uh, neutrals do that in mediation all the time. I'm helping parties take a look at their case from different perspectives, from different angles, bringing in different thoughts so that their own uh, linkages are not the only ones that are, that are um, driving their decisions. So <clears throat> think about it in terms of your own internal decision-making at, say, at a law firm, you know, your hiring practices. 
How do you how do you avoid implicit biases in hiring? People come in. I kind of like this person. That per this person is a good fit, right? Because they're sort of like me. And now all of a sudden confirmation bias kicks in and, and you end up hiring a law firm just like yourself. How do you break that? You break it with committees, unfortunately. Committees actually do help. Uh, committees bring lots of biases in and they will conflict with each other and balance each other out. Um, committees also force a dialogue. So you start to talk about individuals, which means your system two is kicking in and taking charge. Uh, another way to do it is to have some specific criteria for your decision. So if it's a hiring decision, you want them to have a certain grade point average, a certain type of writing skill, uh, a certain type of experience. You write all that stuff in advance before you meet people and then you compare the candidates to the criteria that's been pre-existing, pre-developed. Uh, and that will minimize the impact of uh, some of these biases that we've been talking about. Uh, and you can create accountability. Um, you know, they've, they've done this in baseball. There were studies where it was looking like uh, white baseball players at bat were getting more favorable calls from the ump than black baseball players were. Uh, what eventually happened was they put television cameras on the umpires. Now the umpires know they're being watched by the television cameras and everything evened out. So it was the fact that they knew they were being held accountable, people were watching them. I don't think the umpires were, were intentionally being biased in their calls, but when they knew they were being watched, it forced their system too to kick in to be more deliberative and uh, careful with their decision making and the biases disappeared. Um, so let me give you Ah, so there's a couple other things. One is um, to change the associations you have, as I mentioned before, work with people from different backgrounds, have meaningful, ongoing dialogues with them, and more frequent and shorter is better than infrequent and longer. So if you can meet somebody with, for coffee that's uh, you know, multiple times a week as opposed to going out to dinner once a month, it will have more of an impact. Um, you can actually see, do it with movies. There were people who were showing some, some bias against Asians and they watched the Joy Luck Club, which is an interesting movie about Asians, uh, Asian Americans. And then they actually, some of those implicit biases were reduced afterwards. You can see the movie Hidden Figures and where you've got African-American women in the science, in the NASA doing a lot of the science work and you will start to change those associations you have between uh, race and, uh, and gender. Let me give you as a final exam, and then we'll wrap up this test. So a man and his teenage son went fishing for a day. And on the way home, they had a terrible accident and the father was killed and the son was seriously injured and rushed to the hospital. When the son arrived in the emergency room, the doctor looked down at the boy and said, oh no, that's my son. How can this be? Okay. Figure it out. The doctor was the boy's mother. All right. So system one is saying doctors are men. No, they're not. They can be women. I hope you passed the test. I hope you learned a little bit about implicit bias and think about some of the ways that it impacts you and your lawyering. Uh, and then think about some of the ways you can defeat that to make better and stronger decisions for yourself. Thank you.